Hey, investigators, thank you for joining me for this episode of the Turpin's House of Horrors. Now, before we dive into the details about the case, I want to share with you a podcast I like listening to. It's called Murderish, a true crime podcast hosted by Jamie Rice. The podcast dives into true stories of murder, disappearances, and other creepy events. Hi, I'm Jamie, host of Murderish, a true crime podcast that provides a 3D look at gripping murder cases from beginning to end. You'll get to know the victims and perpetrators, how their worlds collided, and what went down during trial. I also share some of my own personal experiences, like the time a stranger came into my bedroom at night. Yeah, that really happened, and I walk you through all the details of that terrifying night. Have you ever wanted to be a fly on the wall during a murder trial? You'll get that opportunity on Murderish, as I share my experience being a jury foreman on a first-degree murder trial. Search Murderish in your favorite podcatcher app, hit subscribe, and start binging. And remember, listening to this podcast doesn't make you a murderer, it just means you're murder-ish. You can listen, subscribe, and download to both Murderish and this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Play. Basically any provider, and we're there waiting for you. And a special shout out to some listeners who wrote reviews on Apple. It's really helpful for the podcast to get noticed, so thank you. If you write a review, you'll get a shout out as well. So a special thank you to Big Ace Man Fan, The Ginger Tree, Ginge Flyin', Weather Maven, Mary Lose, Miranda from Light the Fright Podcast, Jamie from Murderish, and listeners like you. Now, this is a case that shocked the nation. David and Louise Turpin would be found guilty of torturing 12 of their 13 children in what was called the House of Horrors. From outside their Paris, California suburban home, everything looked perfectly fine. A well-manicured yard and cars with Disney license plates in the driveway. But inside, a very different story. Horrific conditions coming to light after the couple's 17-year-old daughter escaped in the darkness and used her mother's deactivated cell phone to dial 911. What's your name? Gordon Turpin. I live in a family of 15 people, and my parents are abusing, they abuse us, and my two little sisters right now are chained up. And how many of your siblings are tied up? Two of my sisters, one of my brothers. How are they tied up? With rope or with what? With chains. They're chained up to their bed. We live in filth, and sometimes I wake up and I can't breathe because how dirty the house is. When was the last time you had a bath? I don't know. Almost a year ago. I don't know much about my mother. She doesn't like us. She doesn't spend time with us ever. It has been two months since the trial wrapped up and sentencing day. And now Louise Turpin's sister, Elizabeth, is speaking out in this exclusive interview with True Crime Deadline. When the case broke, I was sitting on a plane with my cousin and I said, I told her about the witchcraft and I said, you know, I said, I'm wondering if some of this abuse to the children had to do with the witchcraft had to do with some of the ceremonies what she has to say shocking and in some cases disturbing buckle up investigators you're on deadline from the hollywood hills to your ear holes this is true crime deadline a podcast discussing cold cases murder mysteries and completely random thoughts now here's your host a man who stands in front of crime scene tape and talks on the tv box for a living mr mystery himself matt johnson this case rattled so many people and quite frankly was hard to report on at the time as we were learning details about the children being shackled beat strangled and malnourished inside that house The children also lacked a basic knowledge of medicine and police. The eldest daughter, 29 years old, only weighing 82 pounds when she was rescued. What some are calling a house of horrors. Inside a family home in Southern California. 13 siblings living in deplorable conditions. Tortured by their own parents. 
first off, thanks for thanks for talking to me. And um, I know it must be tough on the on the family, the whole story, just in general. So, how are the Turpin kids doing right now? They're doing okay. Um, the older ones, you know, have their own place to live now, and the younger ones are in foster care. So, have you spoken to them? Um, I saw a couple of them at court. I have not gotten to have a visit with them yet. The lawyer said I had to wait a couple months. Um, when did you know that she was arrested? And what did you think about those allegations? Well, I had gotten a phone call from the police station to tell me that she had been arrested because I was the next living relative because both of our parents had passed away. And Louise is the oldest, I'm the second oldest child. So they called me because I was the next living relative. And um, that's how I didn't answer the phone because I didn't recognize the number and I had her blocked. So I thought she was trying to call me from a different number to try to talk to me. And I really wasn't in the mood to talk to her, even though it had been two years. And so I thought, well, I'll let the voicemail pick it up. And if it's Louise, I'll try to call her back later. Well, I didn't listen to it right away because I was working. I was, I had a book that I was publishing and trying to get out and I had a deadline. And so I was working on that. And then um, somebody on Facebook said, isn't this your sister? And I thought it was some kind of sick joke because they weren't a friend of mine. They put it on my um, author page, so on my public page, not on my personal page. And so, like, when you're in the media a lot, people, you know, you have people that like you and don't like you, you know, so you're going to have both. And so I just, it, it just, it didn't have their picture or anything. It just said 13 children were starved, beaten, and chained. And I was like, what a sick joke. And I just deleted it and didn't even read it. Well, just a few minutes later, a good friend of mine on my personal page said, isn't this your sister? And put the whole news article with my sister's husband and her picture on there. And I about had a heart attack. Well, then I turned on the TV and I thought, oh, my goodness, that phone call. So I listened to my voicemail and it was the police department and I called and that's how I found out. And immediately it was I was like I was denying. I was like, there's no way there's no way. And so um until I saw proof of the house and saw proof, I had a hard time believing it. But I defended Louise on a lot of things that I knew wasn't true. Like as far as them saying the kids never owned a pair of shoes, I knew that was a lie. Me and Louise were always close and I knew that that was a lie. And I had pictures to prove that. And I even lived not far from her for a couple of years. And we saw each other every weekend in from 2008 to 2010. So I knew that there was a lot of things that was exaggerated that wasn't true that I did defend her on. Yeah. So is there anything that you want to clear up with the case? Let me ask you that. Well, as far as the kids not having very many clothes, Louise always went clothes shopping for those kids and they had expensive name brand clothes. And I used to even go clothes shopping with her for those kids. Um, Her kids always had shoes, very cute shoes, lots of shoes. They wore them. I know that for a fact because I lived, like I said, not far from her. We saw each other every weekend from 2008 to 2010. I always had family portraits sent to me with of the kids two or three times a year. She would send pictures out to the whole family. They always had shoes on in the pictures, different outfits. Um, they would say that the kids would go months without eating. That's not true. I even from being in court, from hearing the kids, from talking to the kids when we were getting phone calls before the case started, from talking with the detective, that was a lot. The kids ate every day. They just got to eat one meal. Louise went through some financial issues because they weren't spending their money right, which is her fault. I don't condone that either. She was wasting their money and doing casinos and stuff. And she was in a financial spot and And I think they were having a hard time financially with groceries. But I also know that they were also withholding food for behavior also. But I do know that the kids were, even when they were being held, withheld food for behavior, according to the kids, they were eating one meal a day. But it still wasn't good. I mean, they're malnourished. It wasn't good, but they need to tell the truth. Instead of exaggerating, they're making her worse out than what she was. What What was your reaction when you were like hearing the allegations then? Were you in shock? Were, was the rest of the family in shock? Yeah, we were all in shock. <laughs> I was actually nauseated. I mean, we were all in shock. I couldn't even speak at first to tell my husband what had happened. He kept asking me what was wrong, what was wrong, and... I mean, I had the exact same, my husband told me I had the exact same reaction as I did to my mother and father's death. That's how bad it was. So we were really shocked. And you know, you're a mom, you have, you have uh, seven kids, right? Yes. 
did you see any signs? No, I would I would have done something if I had seen signs. I never saw any signs. Of course, I wasn't around her much at all. Um, we've lived on two sides of the country most of our lives since she got married. I was eight years old, um, except for between 2008 and 2010. And when I lived there, I never saw any signs. Yeah. Was there a breakdown in the family? Did she uh, was she isolated? Um, you mean before she was arrested? Yeah. Yes. She done that to herself. Yeah. She isolated herself from all of us. And um, I was really the only one that she kept in touch with when she isolated herself. She even isolated herself as far as physical contact from me. But she would keep in touch with me through Facebook and over the phone with me. But yeah, I was the only one in the family she kept in touch with. And we had no contact for two years because I blocked her off of everything because we got into a big argument when my parents passed away in 2016. So I had no contact with her up until she was arrested. And so... She was isolated from the whole family, yes. David and Louise Turpin said that they had so many children because they said it was a calling from God. In public, friends and family thought they were the perfect family. They dressed alike. They took trips to Disneyland. And on several occasions, they went to Vegas and renewed their vows. In one of the videos posted online, the family is in a Vegas chapel. All the girls are dressed alike in pink dresses with white tights, and the boys are in suits. And an Elvis impersonator is there officiating the wedding. David and Louise, I now pronounce that the two of you still will be husband and wife. I actually used to tell my kids, I'm sorry, I wish I could give you the life that Louise gives her kids. She was always taking them on vacations and everything. And I never could afford to do that with my kids. You know, my kids have never seen the beach. They've never been to Vegas. They've never been to Disneyland. And or Disney World. And Louise was always doing these things with her kids. And I used to always tell my kids, you know, I'm sorry, you know, I wish. And then when the case broke out, you know, I told my kids, well, you never know what's going on behind closed doors. It doesn't, you know, anybody can paint a picture. Right. Because the picture that they painted, you know, they were at Disneyland all the time. They were wearing matching family outfits. Um, There was that Vegas video that we've all seen. Is that the first time that you saw that video was when it was in the news? No, she actually wanted me to go and do a double. You talking about the one in Vegas of her getting married? She actually tried to talk me and my husband into doing a double wedding with her, like a renewal vow. And I was like, no, that's not me. (laughs) And I'm so glad I didn't now that it's all over the news because people have really taken that out of proportion too. I think, you know, a lot of people do that. And the way that people talked about her, like, that's so crazy and blah, blah, blah. Everybody has different things that they like. And Louise, just because Louise done a crime doesn't mean that she doesn't have an opinion or have something that she enjoys or has something that she, you know, People should leave her alone when it comes to stuff like that, because there was nothing wrong with that. And to me, in those pictures, the kids did not look bad. But I go back through my kids, my pictures all the time of me, Louise and Teresa growing up. And we ate three meals a day and we were tiny. So it runs in our family. So I guess that's why we never saw any signs. When I would see pictures of her kids, even Mamaw used to tell me all the time, my grandmother, her, mine and Louise's grandmother, my mom's mom, she used to say, people would talk about how skinny Louise's kids were. And we were like, mm-hmm. Mamaw would say, all of our kids are skinny. And that was the truth. You know, like we were all tiny and we all ate well growing up. My dad made sure of it. So never thought anything of it. And I've, and since the cases broke, I've looked and looked and looked and looked at our childhood pictures. And I just, just never saw it. How did she end up with David and what is he like? Hi, friends. We are Carl and Joanne, and our podcast is Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. In our lighthearted podcasts, we share our unique ability to find humor in our marriage, adventures, and everyday life. Everything from crashing cars, practical jokes, unique blend of sarcasm, Joanne's ADHD, Carl's ability to be annoyed and entertained at the same time. If you need a little laughter and want to have some fun, find us on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you upload your podcasts. We are also on YouTube. Just search Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. 
she met, we knew David all of our lives. And so David went to church with us. His family did. His parents taught Sunday school, our Sunday school class in elementary school. And um, David asked her out when they were doing a Christmas play one year. And they started going out. And he was six and a half years older than her. He was pretty normal growing up, but he got weird as he got older. Um, Just very flirty towards other females in the family and stuff like that. Were they trying to create their own religion or there was talk about that and there was talk about her wanting to be ha have a TV show or like what was going on? Why'd they have so many kids and what was going on? I never heard her say she wanted her in a TV show. My brother said that he, she told him that. I never heard that come out of her mouth. I know that she used to watch John Kate plus eight and she loved that show and she used to talk about it and compare her family to theirs. But I never heard her say she wanted her own. My brother said that. And um, my brother and her were never close, and they hardly ever talked. So <laughs> I, I really don't know where that came from. But as far as the religion thing, she was trying different religions. She was trying to find where she fit in. And she had even tried Wicca and witchcraft and all that. Before moving to California, the Turpins lived in Texas, just outside of Dallas. Neighbors described the children as malnourished and had odd behavior. The kids would skip around instead of walking outside, and then they would freeze and act quiet when they were spoken to, almost like they were trying to look invisible. When the family suddenly moved in 2010, the neighbors checked on the property. Outside it was a mess. Everything was overgrown. Inside the house, a nightmare. There were ropes tied to beds. There were huge piles of garbage feces throughout the house, and several dead animals. In your book, um, you wrote a book, and it's called Sisters of Secrets, right? Mm -hmm. So you talked about um, her experimenting with religion, and you get into the fact that, you know, she, she was obsessed with witchcraft. And then, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but satanic rituals, what does that mean? Um, she would... Like she messed around with like the Ouija board and snakes, the whole thing and the books, like the witchcraft books and stuff like that. And I don't know if she actually messed around with like the the voodoo dolls or not, but she talked about it. Is that why there was dead animals in the Texas house, do you think? I have no idea. I wondered about that. But I know that they owned a lot of animals and I wondered if they just died from malnutrition. She just left them there to die because she couldn't afford to feed them or what. I also thought that could have been what had happened because I know she was really struggling financially and said she couldn't even afford to feed the kids. Do you think that any of the abuse that happened to the kids were part of a ceremony in her religion? I never would have thought that. But after the case broke, that's the first thing that crossed my mind. I mentioned it to our cousin. What'd you say? I told my cousin, nobody knew about the witchcraft except for me. And when I found out, I told Louise, I said, I would really watch that stuff. That's very serious stuff. Like, I wouldn't have that around my kids. And she kind of laughed it off. She goes, oh, we don't practice it around the kids. We go to the, we go to a hotel. And um, when the case broke, I was sitting on a plane with my cousin and I said, I told her about the witchcraft and I said, you know, I said, I'm wondering if some of this abuse to the children had to do with the witchcraft, had to do with some of the ceremonies. And she goes, oh my goodness, that's a good, that's a good thought. Like that's, you know, that could be. And is it true that they were... They were swingers? Um, I know that they have been. I don't know how long that lasted. Um, I know that I know of one incident. I know that um, one time of that happening, and then I know she created a MySpace page to attract men to swing with. I don't know if there were any more incidents after that because she knew that I, <laughs> I lectured her on it and... A lot of times when I would lecture on stuff, me and her have a very different lifestyle. She would shut down and wouldn't talk to me about it. So I don't know if any more of that went on and she just kept it from me or what. So, you know, you talked about this um, when I first started talking to you. Um, you said that when I was in court on that day that you were also there, you know, sentencing day, um, she broke down. So do you think that that was an honest apology? I think at that point it was. One of the interesting things about covering this case and cases like it is how the community rallies around the victims, in this case the children, 
covering the front lawn and the entrance to this house of horrors with teddy bears, balloons, toys, and notes. And, you know, what was their reaction and your reaction, the family, um, to the Paris community um, laying out? I was I was outside the house and there was all the balloons and the teddy bears. So what were the children's reaction to that? Did they know that that was happening? They were very touched and cried. You know, they were very touched and they were very touched about the money that was, you know, there was a whole lot of money given to. And they were very touched about that. Me, on the other hand, I was very touched when I was told about it. But when I actually went to the home, I had chills and I bawled. It was very, very moving to me that someone would care for my family like that, you know. But it wasn't just that. It was like actually walking up to that door was so eerie because you think, how many ki- How many times did the kids walk up to that door and think, man, I wish somebody I wish I could just scream right now for help and somebody would come and rescue me. Or I, or I would think, oh, my God, why couldn't I see some kind of sign and just show up and knock? You know, all kinds of stuff goes through your head. So it was very emotional for me to see that, um, not just to see that, but just to see the house in general. And when the phrase first um, opened, I went out there like in the first week, within like 48 hours, I was out there and I wanted to go to the house and then I chickened out. So a week later, I flew out there again. And at that time, I was determined I wasn't going to chicken out. And I went to the house and it was very, very, very emotional. Did anyone recognize you? Because I would imagine there was still media there. Yes. Yes. Um, People were running to me and I was just telling them no cameras. I actually went with Dr. Oz so that they could protect me. I called Dr. Oz and asked him because he was going to do a show anyway. And I asked him if he would go with me because I didn't want to go by myself because I knew media would be there. And he said, sure. And he just, Dr. Oz actually stood back and let me have my privacy. He just protected me from the other media. But yes, there was a lot of media and a lot of cameras wanting to come in my face. They did recognize me. Even neighbors recognized me. Were were people positive towards you or? Yes, actually, nobody was negative towards me at the house. I had the first time I went to court, I had a lot of people negative towards me. People um, outside the court spitting at me, screaming at me, just. But then I had people on the other side defending me. It was almost like a protest. It was crazy. And I was trying to run to the car, and then I had people with news cameras in my face, and I had even news people. One guy particularly, I'm not going to say who it was, but he was so rude to me because I just I told him I didn't want to talk. And he started saying nasty stuff and even filmed it on his newscast that night. It was a local news station there in California. Um, even And I was like, he made himself look like a fool because I didn't want to talk. He badmouthed me. He said I had something to hide. Uh, the apple don't fall far from the tree, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I was just, I just laughed it off. I said, he just made himself look like a fool. Of course, I don't want to talk. I just came out of an emotional roller coaster court hearing, the first court hearing since my sister's case broke. I mean, you know. But you know what? You did go on a couple national shows with um, Dr. Phil, Dr. Oz. Um, why was it, and, and you're doing this interview now. Why is it um, important to to share your story? The reason why I share the story is so make people aware that it is out there and it can be in your family and to open your eyes. If a family member comes to you and says, look, we're struggling financially, start looking for signs that the kids might be going hungry. If they say that they're having trouble with kids' behavior, start looking for signs that the kids might be being mistreated. Um People get in their minds that it can never happen in my family or so-and-so could never do this. But that's exactly what we thought about Louise. Nobody would have ever thought Louise would allow that to happen to her children or that she would even participate or do that to her children. And so I think it's important for people to know that it does happen and it can happen to anyone. Um, there's nobody that it can't happen to. It can happen to you just like it happened to me. The truth is, The truth is we don't know what's going to happen when we wake up the next day and anything can click in anyone's mind at any moment, anything can change. And so it's important to get the message across that it's important for us to get the message across for the abused 
so that they will cry out for help, but it's also for the abuser so that they will wake up and think, oh my gosh, what I'm doing is wrong. Because a lot of times, like, I really think that when people are sick in the mind, sometimes what they're, what they're doing, they think is the right thing to do at the moment. I know that sounds weird, but when you take psychology, you'll understand it. For instance, Louise might have thought that chaining her kids might have been the right thing to do at the moment because of, I'm just using her as an example, you know. Um, let's say she was chaining them to keep them out of junk food. Well, it, it wasn't, but if one of the kids were a diabetic and she was chaining them to keep them out of the, you know, the junk food, she might have thought she was doing something good. That's not the scenario in her case. I'm just saying that it can be a wake-up call for people that are abusing their kids and not even realize they're abusing them, thinking they're doing good for them. It's also good for people to wake up and think, oh my goodness, you know, this could be going on in my family because their sons or whatever, and not even realize their sons. So it's good for us to talk so that we can alleviate some abuse. During sentencing, we weren't able to show the children's faces, and not all the victims decided to read impact letters. But there was a dog nearby, an emotional support dog, and they all took turns petting this dog and then reading their statements. We were able to learn a little bit more about the children as well. They had started college, a few of them, And they were living on their own. And through all of this, the kids forgave their parents. An emotional day in court as we heard from the children for the very first time that were tortured and abused in the so-called House of Horrors. My parents took my whole life from me, but now I'm taking my life back. Sometimes I still have nightmares of things that had happened, such as my siblings being chained up or getting beaten. I love my parents and have forgiven them for a lot of the things that they did to us. Life may have been bad, but it made me strong. Today, only Louise Turpin offered an apology. I want to say again, I'm truly sorry. I am for everything I've done to hurt them. That was sentencing day in court earlier this year. Out front of the courthouse was rows and rows of reporters and live trucks from San Diego, Palm Springs, L.A., and the network. What was that like being in court on that day? Because you were there on sentencing day. I was there, too. It was hard. I mean, I cried the whole time. If you were there, you saw. And there was times I had to hold my breath because it was overwhelming. I almost cried out loud. I was holding the tissue over my face and holding my breath to keep from crying out loud. It was very emotional for me. Were you able to talk to the children during that or right after? No. um, The lawyer said that he didn't want anybody talking to him for about two months after court. Got it. So you're still waiting. Yeah. Um, Have you talked to Louise at all? Yes. I go visit her. Oh, talk to me about that. What is that like? seeing her what do you say well i really try not to talk about the case much anymore i mean in the very beginning when i first in the beginning of the case when i first started going to visit her we talked about it but i try not to anymore i try to just talk normal sister stuff just to try to keep it normal um i talked to her before and after court before the sentencing and after the sentencing and of course we did talk about the case then i just asked her if she was okay and all that. And she said that she was um, excited about being moved to a prison because it'll be better. She's heard and there'll be more freedom there. And she was tired of being in the jail, but she was glad it was over. She was glad it was the end. And she was glad that the judge was going to let her start seeing the older children. Did that surprise you when during the sentencing, the children, um, a few of them read letters and they said that they forgave their parents and that they were praying for them? Well, not really. You know, uh, yeah, most of them said that they forgave their parents, but a couple of them said that they were more forgiving towards Louise, if you noticed. And the whole time the case has been going on, I know that the kids have directed more towards David being the fault of all this. And if you noticed, um, a couple of the letters even said that, um, that he was the mastermind pretty much. That's not how they worded it, but they said that he made Louise who she is and that, that when he was at work, she would rock in the rocking chair and say she'd cry and say she didn't know what she was 
to do and she was sorry. And I think, you know, the kids understand that she was scared that she would lose the kids too. Even one of the letters said that she was scared she was going to lose the kids too. And she didn't know she was scared. She cried out for help. She'd lose her kids. I think Louise was sick in the mind. I'm not making excuses for her. I don't condone what she done. Um, but she was sick in the mind. And I think David helped contribute to that. And I think that she couldn't see like a healthy mind. Well, if I lose my kids, at least they would be in a healthy situation, you know, if I got help and I lost them. No, I also don't, it doesn't surprise me that they want to forgive both their parents. I come from an abusive family and you, a child does want to forgive. You want to love your family no matter what's happened to you. And I've always been very forgiving. Why do you think it is that, you know, you're able to take your story and own your truth and the abuse that you've talked about in your book and turn that into teaching others and being powerful? And why do you think your sister went in a different path? Well, studying psychology in college, um, everybody's personalities go in different directions. And also paths that we choose and who we hang out with makes a difference in the way we go in the direction we go in life. Louise and my personality is two totally different personalities. Louise held grudges. I never did. I was always very forgiving as a young child. I had a big heart. Louise, not so much. We are two totally different people. Louise took a lot after my mother and I took a lot after my father. My mom used to always, when she'd get mad at me, you're just like your father. And I am, and I'm so happy. I'm just like my father. That makes a big difference. The way our brains work, the way we think, our personalities, but it also makes a difference on who we hang out with. The men that we married are two totally different men, very different men. Um, who we surround ourselves with, the friends we hang out with were two different, totally different types of friends that we hang out with. And, you know, it's funny that you asked me that question because I've asked myself that question. So I've studied this and studied this and I took psychology in college. And so I've came up with this already. And I think overall, who she was married to, who she hung out with, her personality, what she chose in life and the direction she went made the difference. David and Louise Turpin are in prison serving 25 years to life behind bars with the possibility of parole after 22 years. The judge in the case, he said that he wished that he could have given them a tougher sentence, but his hands were tied because of the plea deal. How often do you visit her in, in prison? And what do you talk about? You said you talk about sister stuff. What is that? I you know, just like, how you doing? And talk about childhood stuff. Do you remember this? Do you remember that? Try to keep it light. Um, try to bring back happy memories when Louise was in a healthier mind state and when she had a good heart and, you know, just stuff like that. And just let her know that I do love her and I'm praying for her and I think about her and that I always tell her that I don't condone what she done and that I don't think she should be free. She knows how I feel. I'm very forward with her. That's just my personality though. I speak my mind and she knows that. And I am very forward with her. She knows how I feel, but she also knows that I care and I love her. I'm the only one in the family that still keeps in touch with her. What does she have plans for her life now? Does she want to have a relationship with the kids? Does she want to change as a person? What What has she said about that? Yes, she told me that she wants, she hopes that she'll have another chance with her children's relationship, and that she hopes that they can forgive her and that, that she can have a the best relationship she can moving forward. How is the family going to rally around the children to, to help them through this? Well, as soon as they will let us, they said that it'll be a couple months, um, which is, around the 1st of July, as soon as they will let us, we're going to start getting our visits with the children. And we just want to support them and let them know that there is family that are in the right minds and that do love them and that do treat their kids right and that are there for them in any way. And the kids know I've been there because ever since the beginning of the case, I've taken them stuff. I've sent them letters. I've called them. I've called to check on them. Their, their attorneys have um, sent messages through me. I've sent them gifts. I've actually personally taken them gifts, but we want all, we want more family besides just me so that they know that they are loved and thought about and cared for in the world. Is there anything that I haven't asked you yet that you, that you wanted to get out there that you wanted to say? I just want people to realize that 
you know, Louis is still a person and I'm still a person and I'm tired of being called Louis Turpin's sister. <laughs> you know, I used to be known as the author and speaker Elizabeth Flores, and now I'm known as Louis Turpin's sister. I do not want to be known as Louis Turpin's sister. I want to be known as Elizabeth Flores, the author and speaker. I did not do the crime and I shouldn't be labeled as the crime. Investigators, thank you for joining me for this episode, which I find not only disturbing, but difficult to talk about because we're talking about kids here. 13 kids that were abused by their parents. From withholding food to keeping them captive with ropes and chains, no medical care, no basic hygiene. And then the mother in all of this, who we're learning about, Louise Turpin, she tells her sister that she's excited to be leaving jail and going to prison because she hears that it's going to be more comfortable with more freedom there. Imagine that. Investigators, until next time. Thank you for investigating True Crime Deadline with Matt Johnson. For more information about the podcast, visit truecrimedeadline.com. And remember, all tips regarding a case should go to the police. Until next time. Mr. Gatsby, want a cookie? Good boy. Is this thing on? Oh well, Mr. Gatsby, I was going to tell the investigators about our cool new Crime Time website called, you guessed it, TrueCrimeDeadline.com. There you can read about the podcast, the cases, and me, your host, Matt Johnson. And you can see crime scene photos and pictures of the missing and the murdered. There's also a section where you can sign up for a newsletter or email alerts and submit episode ideas. Now, aside from the website, of course, Mr. Gatsby, there is that Twitter account. There's also the Instagram and the Facebook page, all under the name True Crime Deadline. I sure wish this thing was on because I'd tell the listeners, our investigators, thanks for listening.